Here at Powerline, we spare no effort to bring you the best reports and analysis of current events, politics, culture, and even sports. Sometimes we even go mobile. A couple weeks ago, Powerline's crack video crew descended on Friday Harbor, Washington to visit in person with one of our favorite thinkers, Herbert Meyer. We've taken note of her before here on Powerline, but this was our first chance to visit with him in person. Back in the Reagan years, Herb was the vice chair of the National Intelligence Council and special assistant to CIA director William Casey. Since then, he has written a string of fine books under his own imprint, StormKingPress.com. He speaks widely and publishes frequently with our friends at The American Thinker and Ricochet.com. I began our wide-ranging conversation by asking Herb to reflect on why the U.S. has experienced so many intelligence failures in recent times. It's a good question. Let me give you a complicated answer. First, there are a lot of men and women in our intelligence service who are doing a terrific job. They work very hard. They keep us safe. We owe them our gratitude. The problem is the leadership, not the troops. Here's why we're having a problem. In most businesses, most organizations, the difference between failure and success lies in the quality of management. That's why successful CEOs are paid so much money. They're worth it. They're rare. There are some highly specialized organizations where the difference between failure and success has very little to do with management. It depends on talent. For example, an opera company. You know, the Kennedy Center is fantastic. But if you're staging La Boheme and you give the role of Mimi to my neighbor, Eleanor, it's not going to be a huge hit. Not at 100 bucks a ticket plus parking. On the other hand, if you give the role of Mimi to Anna Netrebko, one of the world's great sopranos, it'll be a sensational evening. And if, high school gym. And if Anna Netrebko was singing in a high school gymnasium in Spokane, Washington, backed up by the high school marching band, it would be one of the greatest evenings in the history of opera. She could overcome all the obstacles you put in front of her. An intelligence service is one of these highly specialized organizations. And the special talent you need is the ability to spot a pattern with the fewest possible facts. The ability to look at a situation and say, oh, I can see where that's going. I can see what that means. Why have we had so many failures? Because we no longer have people with that talent at the top echelon of our intelligence service. Can I, can I give you some examples sure. of this? I want to give you three examples. The first one has nothing to do with intelligence, but it's so clear that when I give you the next two examples, you'll grasp it. If you were a physicist in 1900, you were studying light. Light was a wave, obviously, but it wasn't behaving the way a wave would behave, and physicists were going crazy. Along comes Albert Einstein, and he made an intuitive leap. He said, light isn't a wave. It's a particle. That's why we can't get everything right. He didn't, when you say someone makes an intuitive leap, intuition is the product of knowledge, judgment, experience. So he made that leap. But he didn't stop there. He wrote out the formula, E equals mc squared, energy, mass, m, speed of light squared. But he didn't stop there. He said, look. If I'm right about this, there ought to be a way to test my theory. He said, so if light is a particle, that means it has mass, weight. It's affected by gravity. So as light comes out from the sun, the sun is a star, it emits light. As it goes flying past Mercury, the planet closest to the sun, it would be bent by the gravity. And he even said what degree he thought it would be bent. Well, he published his paper. Nothing happened. But in 1917, there was an eclipse of the sun. Scientists were able to actually look for this bending of the light. They found it, and the world changed. That's how you do it. Let me show you how we did that in the Reagan years. When we got to Washington with President Reagan, the CIA and everyone else was insisting that the Soviet economy was growing at an annual rate of over 3%. That's very good. We were barely growing at 3%. If we're both growing at 3%, you're never going to end the Cold War. It's going to go on forever. We came in and we said, that's crazy. It can't be growing at 3%. can't even be growing. It's beginning to implode. This wasn't just an academic argument between economists. This is the ball game. If the Soviet economy is on the verge of imploding, you could end the Cold War. 
And by the way, this is what caused the political explosion at the CIA. When we challenged the fundamental view that the Soviet economy, although it was different from the United States, was sort of growing in the same way and at the same rate. That's what caused the massive political upheaval. So I got a bunch of guys together, mostly the younger guys. The senior people had no interest in this. They thought this was crazy. Got some younger guys and said, look, let's just make the intuitive leap that we're right, that it isn't growing. What would we find if it was on the verge of collapse? What would you find if a corporation was on the verge of collapse? You could make a list. They stop hiring people. They let people go. They don't renew the lease on the corporate headquarters. The owner sold his home in Chicago. He's buying a retirement home in Florida. You could make a list of what you would find. Well, with one of the younger guys, we made a highly technical list of what our spies would find if it were correct that the Soviet economy is about to implode. Then I took that list and I went overseas to our spies. Gave them the list. I went to MI6, England's intelligence service. Uh, Francis Dizier, Israel's Mossad. Every meeting was the same. I said, look, this is what we think is happening. If we're right, these are the things you'll find. You actually give them the list. Then you take one more step. You say, look, if you find anything on this list, don't put it in a file folder or a weekly report. I've got to see it. Now, we didn't have email then the way we do now, but we had special codes that would jump the whole system and get it to the director without anybody seeing it. Once it got to the director, I could get my hands on it. Give them the code. And then you go home and you wait. If nothing comes in, it's for one of two reasons. Your spies are idiots, or you're the idiot. Your theory's wrong. It's got to be one of the two. Steve, we could spend all day telling spy stories of things that came in we'd never seen before. Can I tell you one? Sure, please do. There was a train that went from Moscow to Toliadigrad delivering meat for the workers. Toliadigrad is the Detroit, has automobile plants. And it was the weekly meat delivery train. Well, one week, a bunch of workers hijacked the train. This was right out of Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid in the middle of Russia. They're hijacking the train. They're holding the conductors hostage. They're offloading the meat onto stolen trucks. The army was sending out tanks, and they got to just kill everyone, including the conductors, which is what they would do. And by the way, a month after that, then they would kill the tank commanders. So there's no living soul who knows what happened. Anyway, the Politburo jumped into the middle of this and told the army to back off. They said, just let these guys have the meat. Don't let anyone find out we caved in because we've got meat shortages throughout the whole country. Wow. We had that on the president's desk in five minutes. And there were more stories like that. Months later, I'd loop back overseas. I'd talk to our spies. I'd say, guys, the stuff you're getting me now, that crazy story about the meat train and this thing and that, why didn't I ever see that before? And they said, well, we didn't know you were looking for that. It was out stealing rocket parts or whatever we had told them to do. People would stop me in the, the cafeteria at the CIA and say, hey, have you seen this? I said, well, no. Why didn't I ever see this? Well, it didn't fit anywhere. And, and the guys took it off, you know, out of the equation. But once the door was open for that, things began to flow in. And this is the first most important lesson of intelligence. You have to know what you're looking for to find it. So we started looking for this kind of information, and it just poured in. Eventually, we put together an accurate picture of the Soviet economy. President Reagan figured out how to push him over the edge, and that's how we won the Cold War. This is what did not happen before 9-11. Before 9-11, our intelligence service did not say, we think al-Qaeda is already in the United States planning an attack. So they made, never made a list of what you would find if that was true. No list. They never gave it to anybody. Not just spies, but police departments, FBI. No one was told what to be looking for. No one was told what to look for. No one was told what to do with it if they found it. In other words, there was no one in Washington, in effect, crouched over the red telephone waiting for it to ring. So when FBI agents in Phoenix and Minneapolis discovered they were single men from the Mideast in the United States, paying cash for flying lessons, and saying, teach me to fly a 767, but don't bother teaching me how to land, because I won't need to know that. That was on no one's list to report. That's how 9-11 happened. And by the way, the 9-11 Commission missed it completely.